Shoreline is a church that has lots of transition. We have about 300 families a year leave Shoreline with the military through education for whatever reasons they're moving. And, uh, and Brittany, we love you. Brittany and her family, she's been on our staff and also has volunteered as a worship leader for how many years? Five years. And so um, we love you. Thank you for your ministry. And uh, come back and visit us. And, and, and for all those that transition from Shoreline, we always, you got to get a coin. We got to give you a coin and pray for you. Yeah, but we always want to send you with the word of blessing. And so uh, transition is, is part of life, but it's not always the easiest part. So Lord Jesus, we pray as we open your word now, as we look together what you have to say to each one of us, that you would lead and guide us. Sometimes that leading and guiding keeps us right where we are for a long time. Sometimes, like our military folks, that leading and guiding means regular moving. And sometimes with a job change or educational completion of a degree, people move from place to place. Would you go ahead of those who are making moves uh, to prepare their next place for them? Would you use them to glorify you in that place? We pray that uh, for, for Brittany and Kyle, for their family, Lord, for your blessing and your hand upon them. And so, Lord, just now as we open your word, speak to us. Speak your truth. Teach us. And help us to walk in the victory that's found in Jesus Christ and him alone. We pray for his glory. Amen. Amen. Well, we are starting a six-message series, five weeks, six messages, because this coming week has two messages, Good Friday and Easter. We're starting a series called Victorious. And it's about walking in the victory of Jesus Christ. And we live in a world that's kind of, kind of like a little bit nervous about victory these days. The idea of saying that you want to win or have victory. People get nervous about that. But I think it's a, it's a very biblical theme. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ won the ultimate victory for us. And we better be glad that he did. But here, here's the thing. In, in every part of life, if you want to be victorious, you need to have a strategy. You need to plan for it. Victory doesn't just happen. Winning doesn't just happen. And this is true for lots of areas of life. Like I think about, I think about uh, sports. I got to coach soccer for about 10 years. Some years I coached two or three teams because I coached my sons from the time they were little till they got into high school. And all three of them played soccer. So I coached a lot of soccer. And so here's a great strategy for soccer. You get a bunch of kids together and you say, hey, go out there and try hard and we'll win. That's our strategy. Try hard. Guess what? That's not a strategy. That's a nice word of encouragement. But I coached soccer for years and so I would teach kids stuff like this. We'd start with things like this. Okay, in soccer... You have to kick the ball, and you want to go a certain direction on the field. And then you want to kick the ball in the goal. And if the kids ask, well, why? You say, because then you get a point. Not 10 points, not 20 points, not 7 points, not 3. Just one point. Soccer is very simple. Kick the ball in the goal, get a point. Hit the ball in the head with your, you know, hit the ball in the goal with your head, you get a point. And, and so I'd explain that to the kids. And then I would teach them things like, I'd teach them things like this. I actually had this one kid, Derek, and Derek had like the strongest, you always look for kids, got a, most kids are right leg, this kid had an amazing left foot, so I put him at left forward, a scoring forward, and I, and care, I coached Derek for years. So at the first day of practice with new kids, I'd say, hey, Derek, come here. And I put the ball about five feet from the goal. I'd say, Garrett, I said, Derek, kick the ball in the goal as hard as you can. And he'd just, he'd just go and bam, you'd hear it pop and hit the net, and it was like, whoa, that's impressive. And I said, okay, kids, kids, how many points is that worth? Anybody know the answer in soccer? One. I said, and I put the ball back in. I said, now, Derek, here's what I'm going to do. Tap the ball in the goal. Just go like this. And just let it roll across the line. I said, how many points is that worth? What's the answer? One. Why did I do that? It was strategic. Because these kids, when they would get close to the goal, they wanted to kill the ball. They wanted to crank it in the goal. And so they'd miss the ball. They'd fall over. They'd kick the ball and go off to the side or go over the goal post. So I said, if the ball's right there in front of the goal and you're there, just get it in. Simple strategy. I'd also teach them this. I'd say, okay, now I want to show you something. I want you to take the ball, and in, in soccer it's called dribbling, just like you do it in basketball, you do it with your feet, and you're going to dribble for 30 yards as fast as you can. So they dribble down the field with the ball, 30 yards. Okay? Now I said, somebody else stand there in 30 yards. I said, now pass the ball. Pass it. I said, now which one got there quicker? The pass or dribbling it? The pass every time. So we're going to be a passing team. You're not going to hog the ball and keep it to yourself. We're going to do smart. So I'd give them strategies. And so we'd go out to play. I remember one time Sherry showed up to a game, and Sherry had, she ran a race that day. She got about there about 10 minutes into the game. And our son Zach, who always played forward, was at fullback. She said, why is Zach at fullback? Why this thing, if any kid scored three goals, they had to go back to fullback. They couldn't score anymore because then you, would, you didn't want to crush the other team. And she got there about five minutes into the game, and Zach's all the way, the way back at fullback. Why is he at fullback? I said, he already scored three goals. As a matter of fact, our team has six goals. Why? Strategy. 
Because a lot of the teens, the parents would just, the parents would they just say, well, just run around, kick the ball, and have fun. Having fun is great, but that's not a strategy to win. In your financial world, if you want to be victorious and successful, you need a strategy. Here's a crazy, here, you know, so here's a, here's a financial strategy. I want more money, and I want to enjoy my money more. You teach our financial, uh, my, that's not a strategy. That's, that's aspiration, right? But how about this strategy? Make a budget. Ah, let's add something to that strategy. Follow your budget. That's even better than just making a budget, right? Here's a strategy for finances, financial freedom. Don't, don't buy stuff you don't have money for. Don't buy on credit. Because then you pay more money for something you usually don't need with money you don't have. If you, and you start following a strategy. Is this, Doug, can you have a great financial? Follow a strategy, right? It's true for virtually every area of life. Uh, bre breaking a bad habit. I'm going to try harder to break my bad habit. Is that a strategy? No, because it doesn't work. I'm going to get some accountability. I'm going to change certain behaviors. I'm going to get in a 12-step program. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet with people. Who are gonna, you know, I'm going to strategize for change. But the, the one area above any other that you need a strategy for is to have victory spiritually. Because we are in a spiritual war. And you have an enemy of your soul who hates you and wants to destroy you. And if you want to fight against the enemy, you will not win without a strategy. And God's word gives us strategic ways to move forward and to walk in victory. And if you want to be victorious in your life and in your spiritual life, you have to understand your enemy. You have to know the source of the power you need. And you have to have a strategic way you live your life to walk in victory. So God, this is our prayer today. For every single person listening to these words at home, in the parking lot, here in the courtyard. For every single one of us, this is our prayer, O oh Lord, that we will hear your word and know your truth and stand strong in the battles that are raging around us, that we would see with clarity our enemy and his tactics. We will know the power of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and we will walk and live in that power, and in his name, we will plan and strategize and work for the victory that Jesus has already won, but we need to learn to walk in every day of our lives. So God, speak your truth to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that is your prayer today. I hope that if you know Jesus, you're ready to walk in his victory, and if you don't yet know Jesus, I hope and pray today that you'll see what the source of victory is. So here, I want to talk about three things today, and they're three pretty straightforward and simple things. Here's the three things. You have a real enemy. You have a powerful Lord who's greater than your enemy. His name is Jesus. And you can establish strategies for walking in victory. A real enemy, a powerful Lord, and plan strategies to walk in the ways of Jesus. So let's start with that first one. Number one, we have a real enemy. His name is Satan. And he is more real than we often recognize. Satan is more real than we often recognize. I would say probably more real than we almost ever recognize. We don't notice at times the battle that's going on around us. And when we don't notice, we're almost sure to lose. And that's happening a lot in our world right now. So look with me at the Gospel of John chapter 10. And, John, and keep your Bibles open today. We're going to look at a number of different passages. Uh, they'll be on your screens at home. I'll read them here in the courtyard and in the cars. But also you can open up your Bible or your Bible app. And So go with me to John chapter 10. And Jesus is teaching, and he says this. It's in the middle of this amazing, uh, well, I, I can't give the whole context, but he's talking about Satan, the enemy. And he says this in John 10.10. 10. He says, the thief, that's, that's Satan, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. There is no greater contrast in all the Bible than that. Satan comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus comes to give life and life abundantly. Why are so few people following Jesus and experiencing his abundant life and so many people buying into the lies of the enemy? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That, that is Satan. We know Satan's mission statement. Satan's mission statement, I mean, the, the, the banner as you know, the banner over all Satan does is, is this: steal, kill, destroy. What's next? Steal, kill, destroy. What's next? Steal, kill, destroy. That's what Satan does. And we've got to understand that and recognize that there's a spiritual battle going on. In 1942, C.S. Lewis, this great British scholar, 
He wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters. It started as a series of letters written in a kind of a Christian periodical, and he put them together in a book in 1942. If you've never read The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis, it's absolutely worth a read. Here's how it's written. It's written as if it's written a bunch of letters from a senior demon named Screwtape, Uncle Screwtape, written to Wormwood, this kind of under demon, giving him instructions on how to deceive and destroy, steal, kill, and destroy the lives of people. It's, it's, it's a terrifying book, but it's one you should read because it reminds you of the spiritual battle that's going on. And C.S. Lewis actually brings out a lot of the tactics that the enemy uses against us. And so, you know, we need to just recognize, wait a minute, why did C.S. Lewis write that book? He wanted people to wake up and go, wait a minute, this is real. This is really a battle going on. In 1977, a Christian musician by the name of Keith Green wrote a song with the same purpose, to wake people up. His song was, was the, 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 the title of the song was Satan's Boast. Keith Green, this Christian musician, wrote an entire song as if he were Satan singing the song. And, and the refrain in the song, at the end of the song, it was this. It was, here's what Satan says in the song. He sings out, I used to have to sneak around, but now they just open their door because no one believes in me anymore. No one believes in me anymore. No one believes in me anymore. I used to have to sneak around. Now they just open their door. And here's the sad thing. The more, the more we want to ignore the reality of Satan and spiritual warfare, the more we open ourselves up as a target. Don't think if you don't believe Satan exists that he doesn't know you exist. He knows you exist. He knows your weak points. And he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus comes to give you life and life in the full, life abundantly. We have a real enemy. His name is Satan. And he's more powerful than we realize. But he's not all-powerful. Satan is more powerful than you realize, but he's not all-powerful. God is all-powerful, but Satan is incredibly powerful. As I thought about this, and I'm going to read a passage, turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. I, I've got this little rag doll up here, which you're saying Kevin always has little toys and stuff, but uh, I brought this up here because I thought, I had this picture in my mind as I was reading this passage and thinking about this, that me against Satan in my own power, I'm like a rag doll. I got no control. Now, if you're worried about this rag doll, don't be worried about it. Be worried about what Satan wants to do to you. This is just an illustration. The doll will be fine. I'm fine. Um, but, but, you know, but I have this picture of Satan just taking us and just having his way with us if we don't have the power of Jesus in us. He's that powerful. We cannot overcome him in our own strength. Now, we'll look in a minute about the fact that in the power of Jesus, we can But, but that picture of Satan just having power over us. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 5 beginning in verse 8. In 1 Peter 5, 8, we read this. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's his goal. Steal, kill, destroy. Devour your life. Looking for someone to devour. But listen to this. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. In faith in Jesus, you can stand strong, but you got to be ready. you got to resist. Because you know that the same... That, that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. The challenges you're facing, every Christian faces. If you're a follower of Jesus, the enemy's going to want to come and steal, kill, and destroy. You just have to choose to enter into the battle and to fight back. We've got to recognize that our enemy is prowling around like a lion, looking, seeking someone to devour. And he wants to devour your relationships. He wants to devour your hope. He wants to consume and destroy your joy. He wants to devour your resources, your meaning, your faith, your physical health. Everything that's good and beautiful, Satan wants to destroy. Any idea in your mind that these little cartoons of, of, of like, you know, a, a, a nice angel over here and a, you know, kind of a, kind of a naughty, sassy angel, you know, a, a demon over here, and, that, 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 you know, that, that God is nice, but then that Satan and, and demons could be kind of like a, oh, they're kind of fun. And, it, you know, I've heard people say, well, I don't even want to go to heaven one day. I want to die someday and go to hell with Satan and, and all my friends will have an eternal party. I've had people say that to me. Say, oh, it's not an eternal party. It's a lie from the pit of hell. There is nothing good about Satan. He is powerful, but he's not all-powerful, and he comes to destroy. We have a real enemy. His name is Satan, and he's more evil than we imagine. However evil you imagine Satan being, he's worse. You know, we personify certain people in history. Adolf Hitler, 
you're the pinnacle of evil. Evil people learn that evil from Satan, the, the prince of darkness, the one who is ultimately evil. And he's more evil than the most evil person could ever be. And he hates Christians. He hates all people. Satan's not on the side of people who aren't Christians. He wants to destroy everyone. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy everyone and everything he can. And we praise God that Jesus came to bring victory. Look at me at John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, Jesus is talking with the religious leaders of the day. And they're in a serious, heated debate. And he's telling them, he's saying to them, listen, you think that your father is Abraham. You think that your father is God. But your father is the devil. And you better wake up. He's calling them to wake up. And so listen to what Jesus says in John 8, 44. He says to these religious leaders, you belong to your father, the devil. And you want to, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He's, he's not only he says you belong to the devil. He's saying you're doing what the devil wants. And here's what Jesus says about Satan. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is an absolute deceiver and liar who comes to steal and kill and destroy, and we, we take him lightly at our own peril. We look the other way and ignore him, and don't realize that when we look the other way, we kind of walk away, try to act like he's not there. We turn our back, and he pounces. That's what Satan does. And if we don't wake up and realize this, we're going to become his prey. He shows no mercy. Think about a lion on the plains of Africa. And that lion is, is out hunting, and it sees four or five gazelle. And there's three or four healthy ones, and there's one that has a kind of an injury, and it's moving slower. Who's the lion going after? Does the lion stop and say, Aw, this is so sad. That gazelle has a sore leg. I'm not going to attack. I'm going I'm to have a nice chase against it. That, no, the enemy goes, oh, you're an easy target. Bam, I'm on you. Satan's looking to attack. And, and if you don't recognize your own weak points, you better realize he does. We better recognize our own weak points and fortify ourselves because the enemy does, and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He, he wants to take us out. He's looking for our weak spots. So I want to ask you a question. Do you know your own weak points? I'll frame it a different way. If you were Satan, where would you attack you right now? Where would you attack you? Because that's where he's going after. You know your weak points. I know you do. I know my, nobody knows my weak points more than I do. I have friends and my wife who love me and they'll point them out sometimes. I need that, but I know. So if you know what those are, it's time to fortify those weak points because the enemy knows also and he comes to steal and kill and destroy. He shows no compassion and no mercy. Compa you want compassion and mercy? Look to Jesus. Satan has none of that. Never has, never will. And he's a liar. He lies and says you're not loved. He lies and says your sins could never be forgiven. He lies and says you have no hope for your future. He lies and says you're worth nothing. He's always whispering lies in our ears. He lies and says, you won't get caught. Go for it. He lies and says, it's no big deal. And we believe it when it is a big deal. And we fall into it again and again and again. So here's my question for you. Do you recognize the presence, power, evil, and tactics of your enemy? Do you recognize that you have a very real, and I know, I just know right now, some of you are like, I don't even want to hear this message. I don't even want to think about this. But if you don't think about it, if you don't hear it, you just make yourself a bigger target. Ignoring it doesn't make the enemy go away. Acting like he doesn't exist doesn't make him think that you're not there. Doesn't make you invisible to his attacks. So, so listen and pay attention. And just pause for a minute right now. I just want you to take like 15 seconds. Come back to this later today. But we're going to take about 15 seconds and just think about your life. And say, where is the point that, I, I'm, that I'm pretty sure the enemy is going to probably try to attack me? This temptation, this behavior, this pattern. What is it that he's going to attack you in? And you thinking about it doesn't make him aware, but he already knows. But it makes you aware and prepared to fight back as we talk about some strategies to resisting. And Lord, I pray for every one of us in those areas that we recur and fall again and again into sin those attitudes that are ungodly, those behaviors that are wrong. God, show those to us. And let us take seriously that we don't want to open the door for the enemy. 
Speak your truth to our hearts and fortify us to stand strong for you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. So we have a real enemy. But here's the second thing we have to understand. We have a great Lord, a great and powerful and glorious Lord, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. So I want to think about Jesus, this great Lord that we have. We have a great Lord, Jesus the Christ, and he's infinitely more powerful than Satan. Jesus Christ is infinitely more powerful than Satan. And I say that because I, I, I get this picture in my mind, back to the rag doll. I get this picture in my mind, if this rag doll represents Satan in the hands of Jesus, this is Satan. He has no control. He is not, he's not that powerful compared to Jesus. If it's me against Satan one-on-one, I'm in trouble. I'm the rag doll. If it's me in partnership with Jesus, in the power of Jesus, Jesus' power over Satan, Satan has no power compared to Jesus. Look with me in the book of Revelation to chapter 12. This passage is so amazing. It's this picture of Jesus coming and dealing with Satan, the devil, the great dragon. He's called the great dragon in verse 9 of Revelation 12. Listen to these words, Revelation 12, 9. The great dragon was hurled down, thrown down like a rag doll. That's what gave me the picture. Just like Jesus goes, bam, you're down, you're done, right? The great dragon was thrown down. Now, how do I know it's talking about Satan? It says the great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. That's what he does. He leads people astray. He was hurled to the earth with his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah, Jesus the Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and our sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. Slam dunk, spiked in the end zone, baby. Jesus has power over the enemy. You gotta know that. You gotta believe that. And I want to be really clear, if, 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 you're a, if you've spent a lot of time studying ancient Persian, Persian religions, and I'm sure many of you have spent a great time studying ancient Persian religions, there was a religion called Zoroastrianism. And the, Zoroastrianism had this mindset, it's kind of, it called dualism. Zoroastrianism had this idea that there was evil and there was good. And they're at battle with each other. But the battle never ends because, they're, because evil and good are equally powerful. So it just is this ongoing battle that never really goes anywhere. Okay, what the Bible teaches is Satan, demonic beings, and the power of evil compared to Jesus will be slapped down one day. We still live in the middle of that battle, but there will come a day when Jesus says, done, over with. Until then, we walk really closely with the one who has power over the enemy. And we understand that his power is great and mighty and glorious. We have a great Lord, Jesus the Christ. And he has defeated sin, hell, and the grave. Jesus has won the victory. Now, we got to learn to walk in the victory, but we can't walk in it until somebody wins it and Jesus won it. I can't win it. You can't win it. Jesus won it. That's what we're going to celebrate next week at Easter. That's why it's so good to come to, on Good Friday, remember the price Jesus paid, and come on Sunday and remember the resurrection of Jesus. And so we have to recognize what Jesus has done. He's defeated sin, hell, and the grave. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, almost the whole chapter is about the resurrection. Our resurrection when that which is mortal takes on immortality, when we're changed through the power of Jesus. But look at me at 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 54. The Apostle Paul writes these words. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, this is us taking on these eternal bodies. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Listen to this. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Someone say amen. I mean, that's good news. That's the truth. Now, he gives us the victory. Now we've got to learn to walk in the victory. We'll get to that in just a minute. But we have to recognize the power and the glory of Jesus the Christ. We have a great Lord, Jesus the Christ. And he rules over our enemy with absolute power. But we lack the power without him. Jesus rules over the enemy. In the hands of Jesus, the enemy's like a rag doll. But we have to stand walking with Jesus. We don't have the power in and of ourselves. Look with me at Romans chapter 8. 
And as you're turning to Romans chapter 8, I'll tell you, if you want to find a chapter in the Bible where there's probably more familiar quotes or things you'll see in the plaque on someone's kitchen or someone's house, it's going to come from Romans chapter 8. And this is one of those passages. Romans 8, beginning in verse 37. We're told that no, in all these things, we are made more, we're made more than conquerors, more than victors through him who loved us. That's Jesus Christ. We're made more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, I love this, that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's our source of strength. That's our source of power. We have a real enemy who's very powerful. Compared to him, we're not going to get the job done. We have a real Lord who's infinitely more powerful than the enemy. And when we stand with Jesus Christ and stand in his power, his strength is ours, his spirit lives in us, and we can walk in ways that honor God. So here's a question. Do you walk in the staggering power of the risen Lord Jesus? Do you walk in that power every day? I'm not asking if, if one day 20 years ago you said yes to Jesus. I'm asking, do you walk in the power and the presence of Jesus every day? It makes a difference. It does. You can be saved in Jesus Christ and have ultimate victory when your life ends and not walk in the power of Jesus every day until you come to the end of your life. And I want to invite you today to not walk in the ways of the one who came to steal, kill, and destroy, but to walk every day in the power and the ways of the one who came to give life and to give it abundantly to you and to me. You know, as I was spending some time with Jesus this morning, and I, even on Sundays when I'm preaching, um, and I spend time before I, before I actually went through my sermon, for, I go through my sermon on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I take Friday off, and then shortly on Saturday, and I preach again on Sunday. So I preach about five or six times before I preach it for any of you. And then I, I practice on the nine o'clock service people that give the real power to you guys. No, that's not true. But I, I, so, I, so this morning, before I went through my sermon, I just spent time, what I do every day, and I just sat quietly, and I opened this book. And I said, God, what do you have to say to me? Not, not Pastor Kevin, not a preacher. I'm your child, and I need you to speak to me. I need you to teach me. And I pray and I talk with Jesus. And, and it's not about being a pastor, being at Shoreline. It's just about being a follower of Jesus. I need to sit at the feet of Jesus every day. If I don't, my day's not going to go well. So I was doing that this morning. And I was, I've been walking through Psalms. So I was in Psalm 144. And as I was in Psalm 144, uh, God put something on my heart really strongly today. And there's times I read the Bible and I just, it's, it's great and it's refreshing and it's wonderful. But it's not like there's a big, oh, big thing. It's just, I just, you read it every day just like you eat food every day to stay healthy. You read the Bible every day to stay spiritually strong. I'll come back to that in a minute too. But this morning as I'm reading, God put something on my heart really clear and very strongly. And I actually talked to our team and said, listen, I need a few more minutes of my sermon and we need to plan just to have the kids down the hill a little bit longer because I just want to talk, I need to talk to parents and grandparents for a minute. And I felt like God put this on my heart as I was in Psalm 144 this morning. Um, if you're a parent, and, and let me tell you, my kids now are 34, 32, and 30. I'm still a parent. My 34-year-old called me this morning just with a question about something in his business world and just wanted to check in with me and ask me to get dad's perspective. I'm still a dad, and my son's 34 and lives 2,000 miles away. And so if you have kids, they're, they're little or newborns or teenagers or grown adults or grandkids, I, I feel like God wants to say to us today, um, we have to live for Jesus. We have to get serious about our faith. Our kids and grandkids need to see us on our knees in prayer and sitting with this book open on our laps or listening to scripture as we're cleaning the house or working on the car in the garage. Or I mean, our kids need to see us immersed in scripture. Our kids need to hear us praying. They, we need to have kids that, that, that every time they come to us with a struggle or a problem, they, they know we're going to share some of the scriptures and we're going to offer them to pray to the point where they go, oh, mom, do you always have to make it about Jesus? We need kids that will say that because we make it about Jesus. Why? Because it's all about Jesus. And I think, I just, I worry that too many parents and grandparents are thinking I can send my kid to church for half an hour, an hour a week, and that'll get the job done. It won't. You lead your homes. You teach your kids to love Jesus and follow Jesus. You teach your, if you make, you want your kids to make good choices about what they put in their brains and their minds, you make good choices and model it for them. And, and so as I was praying this morning, thinking about this, as God put this on my heart, this, God put on my heart five different lies 
that, that the enemy is telling your kids and grandkids. Because right now, the cultural battle right now, Satan, Satan is ruling right now in our culture. There's no Christian that would look at American culture and say, oh, it's totally Jesus-centered. There's nobody that would turn on media and say, oh, it's all about Jesus. They're, they're, Jesus Christ has won the ultimate victory, but right now in this world, there's still a battle going on. And so, so here's, here's some of the lies that you need to be teaching your, your kids and grandkids about and tell, speaking the truth to them. Your kids and grandkids are being lied to about their value, about their value as a human being made in the image of God. Many of them are being told that they just came out of a slime and ooze. They just sort of evolved and there's no dignity to them. There's not like a God made them and shaped them. The scriptures say that God formed us and breathed life into us. And the world is saying, you're nothing. You're just, you're just, you're just this evolutionary thing. You gotta speak the truth and tell them, look at them and say, in your mother's womb, you are loved by God and known by God and precious in his sight. And every day of your life was written in God's book before one of them came to be. That's from Psalm 139. Speak the truth to your kids about their value, even if they're 35 or 40, even if they roll their, your, their eyes when you do it. Speak the truth about who they are and their value. They're being lied to about sexuality. This generation, you turn the clock back 15 or 20 years ago, this wasn't going on. But what's become so normal in our culture, everyone just seems to have bought in. I know everyone hasn't bought in, but everyone's just standing back going, I don't want to say anything. Who's going to say to your kids? Who's going to look at your kids and say, hey, buddy, boys are boys, and girls are girls, and God made them different. You know, the, you know the scriptures say that God made them male and female. In his own image, he created them. Male and female, he made them. That's the word of God. God created human beings as men and women. And this is the one eradic- you know, the enemy wants to just, just, just destroy any thinking about that and confuse children. And, and as a pa- who's going to speak the truth? Oh, well, we'll send them to camp. We'll send them to camp once in the summer and they'll straighten up. No, they won't. Every day you pray, every day you love, every day you teach the word of God to your kids. They're being told lies about the truth. This next generation is being raised, being told there is no truth. Or if there is a truth, it's your truth. You just go up with whatever, whatever truth you want. Do you know what the world's going to look like if everyone says the only truth is my truth? That's insanity. The only truth is God's truth, and it doesn't change. Right? Who's, who's going to teach, teach your kids and grandkids this? Who's going to do it? It's going to be you. You know, your kids and grandkids, they need to see you in love with the Word of God. If you have not, if you have not got in your life a regular rhythm of reading the Scriptures or listening to the Scriptures every day, if you can't do it for yourself, do it for the next generation. Live the Word of God. If, if you don't get on your knees and seek the face of God in prayer and pray for your kids and grandkids with passion on a daily basis or a regular basis, learn to do that. Make that part of your life. The next time one of your kids comes to you with a challenge or a struggle, say, hey, honey, can we pray about that together? And some of you are like, I'd feel nervous doing that. Just do it. You, who's going to lead your home if you don't lead your home? Who's going to teach the next generation about Jesus if you don't? And then lies about Jesus and faith in him. Our, our culture is ripping into the Christian church right now. But the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus comes to give life and life to the full. And kids are being told, oh no, life to the full is going out and living in the world, in Satan's ways. No, that's the way to death. And so understand the lies the enemy is perpetuating and stand against them and lies about Christians. You know what? There are some Christians who are wacky and goofy and do strange stuff. But I'll tell you about 99% of Christians I know just love Jesus, want to live for him, want to serve him, and want to honor him. But the world is presenting Christians like they're just all out of their minds. The smartest people I know, the most motivated people I know are people who know and love Jesus. But the world is trying to portray Christians. Every time they put a Christian on TV to to speak to them, they find the most inarticulate, kind of goofy, awkward, uncomfortable person. I'm like, don't hold them up like they represent all Christians. But they're choosing those people to make Christians look bad. The enemy's behind all of that. So your kids and grandkids need to look at you and say, no, that's what a Christian looks like. They're kind and compassionate and loving, but they know what they believe and they hold to it. And so be that parent. So I, this morning, God just put on my heart, I had to pause in the middle of the message, but it fits right there. And just to say, in this battle that's going on, it's not, don't just look at the battle against you. If you're a parent or grandparent, speak the truth, live the truth, know the word, be a person of prayer, and show your kids and grandkids. Even if your kids are in their 30s, 40s, or 50s, you're still modeling Jesus to them. And then finally, 
We can walk in victory in our daily life, in your daily life, by following strategies for the battle. And so I want to just give you some of the, strat- some, some of the, most, some of the most simple, basic strategies to walk in the victory of Jesus. Here's number one. Strategy number one, the name of Jesus. Philippians 2, 9 and 10 says this. Therefore God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You want to fight the battle, you walk in the name of Jesus. You walk in the ways of Jesus. And, but in the name of Jesus means I represent him in all that I do. I seek to look like Jesus, sound like Jesus, think like Jesus, speak like Jesus, serve like Jesus, work like Jesus, play like Jesus would. That the name of Jesus is all over your life. Are you walking in the name of Jesus? And when you pray, you pray with the authority of Jesus Christ. To pray in his name isn't to tag at the end of some silly, selfish prayer. Oh, I want that in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus isn't what you take on the end of the prayer to get what you want. You, the name of Jesus is when you finish a prayer and you say, that is prayed in the name, the authority, the will, and the desire of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the risen and glorious Lord. I pray in his name. That's power. It's not just tagging on in the name of Jesus. It's praying in his name like he would pray. And that means you have to walk with him and know him and love him. Live in the name of Jesus and you start to walk in victory. And then... We can walk in victory in your daily life. Strategy number two, the power of truth, the power of Scripture, this book. I cannot emphasize too strongly for you the need for you to know this book. Read it every day and week by week and month by month and year by year. It will become part of your mind and part of your heart and part of your words. Don't wait for a pastor once a week or once a month or whenever you come to church to tell you what the Bible says. Don't wait for that. Open this book and let God speak to you. Study it, read it, listen to it, pray through it. In Matthew chapter 4, this this account of Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. I mean, if the devil tried to tempt Jesus, you better know he's going to try to tempt you. He knew who Jesus was, and he still went after him, right? I mean, Satan is real. Jesus Christ is, is powerful and glorious and more powerful than him. But in the wilderness, we read these words in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. The tempter came to Jesus and said... If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Three times the enemy came and said to Jesus, he tempted him, tempted him, tempted him. Jesus responded the same way every time. It is written, it is written, it is written. He quote, Jesus quoted the scriptures every time the enemy came to tempt him. If you want, you want a strategy for walking in victory, You get to know this book. And when the enemy comes and lies, you say, no, it's written. That's wrong. That's not true. When the enemy comes and tempts, you say, no, it is written. Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is written written that you worship the Lord your God, and him only will you serve. Every time the enemy comes, we respond by Scripture. We can't do that if we don't know it, if it's not part of us. So immerse yourself in Scripture. Make it part of your life. Sign up for a Shoreline Bible study. Sign up for a Shoreline class that teaches the Scriptures or how to read the Scriptures. Jump in and learn and go deeper in God's Word. We can walk in victory in our daily life. Strategy number three, the impact of obedience and holiness. You want to walk in victory. Learn to walk more and more in holiness. Has it struck you that the word holy or holiness aren't even used in our world anymore? When's the last time you heard anybody use the word holy? Unless they're talking about buying new pants that already have holes put in them or something like that. But I mean, I'm talking about H-O-L-Y. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Listen to these words that Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus, wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Don't, go, don't live like you used to live before you knew Jesus. But just as he who called you, just as God who called you is holy, so you be holy in all you do. For it is written, he quotes from Leviticus chapter 11, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. You want to learn to walk in victory. Say to God, God, what does it mean for me to walk and live in holiness? You know what holiness is? It's living separately and differently than the world. Does your life look any different than the world? than your non-Christian friends? 
Does your viewing habits and what you watch and view look any different than your non-Christian friends? Does the way your mouth works when you're not around church and not around home, does the way your mouth works sound any different than, you, than, the, than the mouths of your non-Christian friends? See, the Amish took this very seriously and said, we're going to move outside of the world. We're going to leave social circles. We're not going to use electricity. We're not going to have any media. And the Amish still to this day have separated. There was a large Amish community not far from where we lived in Michigan. And, and they literally still in horses and buggies. It's not a show. This is how they live their lives. That's how they've separated themselves to be holy, separate from the world. And, and, and I was talking with somebody the other day who was talking about the idea of we need to have a modern Amish mindset. Say, I live in the world, but I'm not going to live of the world. And I need to look different and sound different and act different and think different than the world. If we look no different than the world, then we're living no different than the world. And so we're told here, we're told here, you know, you, so be holy in all you do, in everything you do, be holy, be different. Wouldn't it be great if somebody looked at you and said, what's the deal with that? Why, why don't you do that? Why do you think that way? Why, why do you seem different? I mean, you seem normal and friendly, but you seem different. And they ask and say, oh, because I see the whole world differently. Because I know Jesus. It'll open up the door for great conversations. Not everyone will agree with you, but they'll be fascinated by somebody who actually lives differently. We can walk in victory in our daily life. Strategy number four, in the strength of community, being part of God's family. You want, strong, you want strength to walk in victory? Get in community with God's people. One of the things the enemy has really used through all this COVID time is separating, dividing people, disconnecting people, making them feel lonely and disconnected and far apart from others. We are part of a body, the body of Christ. We need each other. In 1 Corinthians 12, where the Apostle Paul is talking about the church as a body, he says this about the church, us as different parts of the church. If one person or one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one person or one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. We belong to each other. We need each other to rejoice together, to sorrow together, to learn together, to pray together. And so start to reconnect. And again, for the folks at home, I'm not coming down on you, but I'm saying if you're at home out of convenience, if you're at home just because it's convenient to be at home, come join us as soon as you can. Jump, get your kids back in youth group. We've got children's programming going on. When we go to indoor and outdoor worship, we'll have indoor worship and indoor children's programming and outdoor worship and outdoor children's programming. Pick what you want. But when you're ready and when you can do it, if you're physically able and emotionally able to do it, come reconnect. Because there's something about being together that we need, that God wants to feed. So be in community. Connect with other believers. And then finally, we can walk in victory in our daily life, in your daily life, strategy number five, the authority of prayer. To pray with greater passion. To pray with greater power. To pray with greater frequency. In Luke chapter 11, we read these words in verse 9 and following. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. To the one who seeks, finds. To the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Prayer has power. Now, this is not talking about self-centered prayers, gimme, 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 gimme. And oh, God didn't give me exactly what I wanted. It's not that. This is prayer say, you know, this is prayer that's consistent with the heart of God and the will of Jesus. So you look at your own life and where you need to grow spiritually and you start to pray about that. You look at people that are far from Jesus and you pray for them, for their hearts to be captured by the love of Jesus. For the next time you invite them to a service or a youth thing, that they'll actually say yes that time. You get on your knees and you seek the face of Jesus. And you pray passionately and consistently. And you pray in community. This morning after the first service, I probably talked with probably eight or nine different groups of people. And I think six or seven of those, when they shared something, we just stopped and prayed. Because that's what you do. Because there's power in prayer. And some of the needs that were shared were pretty serious needs. And Pastor Dennis and his team were up here praying for people after the service because there's power in prayer. You want to walk in victory, start praying more than you've ever prayed before. Jump, jump into, get on one of our prayer teams and get involved in praying for other people. I remember one, one guy shared a testimony earlier during the whole COVID thing that he came because he lost his job during COVID. He came to volunteer at the food pantry and then he started praying with people that were driving through because we offer every person who comes for food. We offer prayer. We don't force it, but we offer it. And he said, it's just, he says, it's changed my life praying for people for, in hard times because prayer has power. And so we ask, we seek, we knock, and God answers and helps us find things, and he opens the door. So here's the question. What is your next step to victorious living? 
What's your next step to a victorious life? Would you quiet your heart right now? And let me just take a moment and, and let God speak to your heart. What's your next step forward to walk in victory? Maybe it's living in the name of Jesus. Saying, I don't just believe in Jesus, but he is the Lord of every part of my life. And I'm going to let him be Lord over everything. There's areas I've been keeping to myself. I'm going to give those to Jesus. I'm going to say, Jesus, you are Lord. In your name, I give you my family. In your name, I give you my finances. In your name, I give you my free time. In your name, I give you everything. And you just yield things to Jesus and live under the lordship of his name. Maybe that's your next step forward. Maybe your next step is to say, I've got to grow in scripture. I believe it's true. I like hearing it preached, but man, I don't, know, I don't even know where my Bible is. And I certainly don't open it daily. And maybe for you to start using the, the reading guide that we have on the website every week of the year, year round, or calling a pastor and saying, hey, I want to set up a reading plan for my own Bible reading, and we'll help you. We'll get you set up and get started. We'll walk with you. Maybe your next step is holiness. Say, man, there's just parts of my life where I don't look one single bit different than anybody else, even people that aren't Christians. And it's time that I, I be set apart, that I begin to be holy with my words, my thoughts, my viewing habits, my behaviors. I need to look, like, look different than I look, to look more like Jesus. Maybe your next step is growing closer in community, where you just say, you know what, I need to reconnect with the body of Christ. I need to get, I need to get back in a small group. I need to get back. And we're, we're relaunching a lot of stuff after Easter. And if that's you, call the church, let us know, and we will find ways to connect you in community. Maybe I just got to start serving again. I get community when I serve alongside of other people, and it's time to step back in. Maybe your next step in, in growing in this victory of Jesus is just committing yourself to deeper prayer, more frequent prayer, more passionate prayer. And maybe for some of you as parents and grandparents, the Holy Spirit's just saying to you right now, it's time to live your faith in front of your kids. Man, it's not a secret thing. And read, read, your, read your Bible out in public in front of your kids. If you've got little kids, they should, they should see you with that Bible open or listening to the scriptures every day. And see, that's part of your life. Being a model of prayer, a model of following Jesus. Oh Lord, we come before you. And we acknowledge today that we recognize that we have an enemy of our souls who comes to steal and kill and destroy. We recognize the presence and the power of Satan. But Jesus, we recognize above it all that Satan is like a rag doll in your hands, that you have power and authority over him. So Jesus, we don't stand in our own strength. We stand in your strength and in your victory. And we hold your hand and we wrap our arms around you and we say, Jesus, lead us forward in your victory. And so Jesus, we pray that we will take steps this week to walk in victory, that we will live in new ways and think in new ways and pray in new ways, study your word in new ways, connect with your, your family in new ways or re restored ways that have been taken away for a season, that we might walk in the victory of Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life on the cross that we'll celebrate this Friday, the one who rose from the dead who we'll celebrate next Sunday and the one who's with us and in us now. We pray this in his name, seeking his power and offering him all the glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you uh, just a couple quick invitations. First, um, I want to challenge you to register for Easter services. If you're going to be here on our campus in the courtyard or in the parking lot, the services are filling up really fast. And so please register so we know who's coming. And let your invite friends that you're bringing to register also. And then also know that there's invitation cards to invite people. And we'll send you electronic invitation cards on Tuesday. And you can send, send those on to people. If you need prayer for anything, if you were listening today and you said, man, there's, there's a battle going in, in my life or a spiritual battle going on in the life of somebody I love. Please don't leave here. I think it was probably, Dennis, probably 25 minutes into, after the service, this last service, where I saw you still praying with people up there. And so there were people waiting for like 20, 25 minutes. But it's, if you've got time to stay and be prayed for, please go see Dennis and his team to be prayed for. If you're online, you can send us your prayers. You can see there at the email address or you can call. And we have people ready right now live to pray with you. Please don't miss the chance to pray with somebody right now. And if you are new at Shoreline, if you're online and you're new, just text the word welcome to the number you see on your screen now and we will follow up with you and answer your questions. We want to get to know you personally. And if you're here in your car or in the courtyard and you're new and you've never done this, you've, so you've never gone back to the Welcome Center back there. I see Maggie back there. Hi, Maggie, by the balloons. She's got a team of folks there. They want to give you a gift, answer your questions, and give you a warm, personal welcome. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me to receive a word of blessing? If you're at home, I invite you to stand where you are. 
If you are not able to stand, turn your hands upwards as a sign just to receive this word of blessing. This Friday we gather for Good Friday and a communion service. This Sunday we gather to celebrate the resurrection. But for every day of this week and every day of your life, would you walk and live with a deep and profound awareness that there is a real enemy of your soul who comes to steal and kill and destroy? Wake up to that truth. Recognize it. And then remember that Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, has won the victory. Satan is like a rag doll in his hand, so stand in the victory of Jesus. Walk in the victory of Jesus every day, every moment. Grow on that journey. And as you see him bring the victory, give Jesus all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. Amen? Amen. God bless you. We'll see you Friday for Good Friday and Sunday for Easter. God bless you. Have a great week. I want to personally invite you to join us for Easter services at Shoreline Church. We will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, sing some amazing music, and I believe in be inspired. As we move into springtime, nothing's more inspiring than being with people singing, celebrating, and rejoicing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Please join us for Easter services.